Good evening. I'm Rupa Kudwa, CEO of Crisil. My colleagues and I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you to the seminar on investment banking, The Road Ahead. Today's event has been organized by Crisil Global Research and Analytics and Coalition, both of which are divisions of Crisil. Let me briefly introduce Crisil. Crisil, our major majority shareholder, is Standard & Poor's, and we are a global analytical company that began life 25 years ago as India's first credit rating agency. Indeed, today we continue to be India's largest and most credible rating agency, but our largest business today is that which is represented by Global Research and Analytics and Coalition, which work with global investment banks to provide a very rich and unique array of services. So while Coalition works with the strategy teams and the CFOs of investment banks, Global Research and Analytics works with the business and operating teams in research, investment banking, front office, mid office, and the, and the risk areas. Coalition provides key decision makers in banks with unique insights on their competitors, covering revenues, headcount, cost, RWA, and return on equity, and also on their client wallets. Global Research and Analytics supports the execution agenda of banks in research and analytics, as well as in risk management, supporting equity, fixed income, and credit research on the one hand, to CCAR, PRE-related work, model building, and model validation on the other. So as you can see, Coalition's analytics helps banks work on the business, while global research and analytics helps them work in the business. Together, global research and analytics and coalition provide what is an exceptional combination of analytics and services to global investment banks. We work with over 20 investment banks, and that includes all the top 15 in the world. We also work with 23 buy-side firms, including investment management, hedge funds, and private equity firms. What really defines us is a steadfast allegiance to analytical rigor and the credibility associated with our work. The richness of our experience and the depth of work we do with investment banks enables us to provide very deep insights, institutional insights and perspectives. Today's event will demonstrate how we bring the best of global research and analytics and coalition together to clients with analyses, insights, and perspectives that complement each other. Over the next 90 minutes, we will have three short presentations and a panel discussion. <coughs> Let me set a very brief context. After the financial crisis of 2008, the global investment banking industry has been trying to reinvent itself in the face of declining revenues and profitability and the imperatives of efficient capital management. Therefore, banks are today taking decisions on which product lines to build upon and which product lines to jettison based on RWA or capital requirements. They're also making choices on cost structures and increasingly asking themselves the hard questions on where to locate their resources, onshore, nearshore, or offshore, and how to effectively combine these resources using technology and automation. In addition, banks are finding cost-effective ways to manage their regulatory requirements, such as by accessing global talent pools. One of the fastest growing areas of our work is helping US and UK banks with their CCAR and PRA work and model building, model validation processes. Today, we will discuss all these aspects and also the different choices that investment banks have. We will begin the proceedings with my colleague Stefan Besson, providing an overview of the global investment banking industry, such as trends in revenue, profitability, and balance sheet, and how the banks are looking at their business models. Following that, my colleague Suprabha Dikshita will talk about how banks are looking at their operating models and transforming their operating models. By operating models, we mean people, processes, and technology to achieve sustainable cost structures. Next, Dr. James Liu will cover the role of models in efficient capital management. 
We will end our seminar with a panel discussion on the themes that we've presented. I'm very thankful to our four very distinguished panelists, Agus Sujianto, MD, Head of Corporate Model Risk, Wells Fargo, Dave Cohen, Lead Finance Officer, Global Markets and Security Services, Citibank, Mark Flannery, MD and Head of US Equity Research Credit Suisse, and Reto Kohler, MD and Head of Strategy, Barclays, who have agreed to be a part of today's discussions. We look forward to benefiting from their tremendous experience and insights. Overall, I believe that today's discussions will provide some food for thought, validate some ideas and beliefs, and challenge a few. I do hope you find the discussions interesting and insightful. Once again, thank you for taking the time to be with us here today, and I look forward to interacting with you over drinks in the evening. I would now like to invite my colleague Stefan Besson to come on stage and make his presentation. Stefan, over to you. Thank you, Rupa. Um, clearly, the picture needs a, a little bit of update. Um, so let's get started. So in the next 15 minutes, we're going to look at uh, how the very challenging and current environment is forcing investment banks to make trade-offs, and how most of these banks have already started or will have to differentiate their strategies. More specifically, we're going to look at three areas. First, we're going to look at the performance of what we call coalition index, which is the top 10 global investment banks, along a few drivers, revenue, headcount, cost, operating margin, return on equity. Then we'll try to look at what it means for them in the near future. What is the new norm? What the industry will look like? And we'll uh, wrap up by looking at some of the choices or trade-offs they have to make in order to differentiate their strategy around asset class, product offering, and regional presence. So let's start first with the first half 14 performance for the top 10 global investment banks. So let me uh, just list these top 10 investment banks. Uh, Bank of America, Barclays, BNP, Citi, Credit Suisse, Deutsche, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and UBS. So what you have here is the aggregated revenues across these top 10 banks in three asset classes. IBD, 100% of DCM, 100% of DCM and M&A, equities, cash equities, prime services, equity derivatives, and FICC, which has the credit securitization rates, FX, and commodities. So clearly what you can see is the performance has been quite weak in the first uh, half of the year, with a drop of 5% for the top line, many driven by a drop of 11% in FICC. Equities around minus 6%, and IBD with a very strong growth. So now let's look a little bit at as, as what banks, how banks have reacted and what they are doing. First of all, let's look at the headcount picture. So what you have in front of you is the aggregated front office revenue producer for these top 10 investment banks. And what we define at Coalition, the front office revenue producers are sales, trading, structuring, and publishing research. So what you can see here is um, on the high of 2009, a great momentum and a great performance of 2009, banks continued to hire until the end of 2010. And then since 2010, there have been 14 consecutive quarters of headcount reduction, leading between the peak and now of a 20% headcount reduction at the top line. And as you can see, FICC has a very, had a very severe headcount reduction around almost 30%. Equities and IBD around 15%. So now the question is, banks have right-sized the front office operation. How has that translated in terms of cost saving? As these have this reduction translated into cost savings. So what we're going to look on the next slide is the total fully loaded cost of the investment banks across, across three categories. Front office compensation, which is the base and the bonus, other front office direct expenses, and finally overhead and all allocated costs from the group to the IB. So let's start first with the FICC picture. And what you can see here is, unfortunately, the cost savings have not been materialized. There was a 27% headcount reduction, which translated only in 12% of cost, overall cost for FICC space. Clearly, two different trends. If you look at the dark blue, which is the front office compensation cost, a drop of 30%. Unfortunately, the other cost increased, and many around middle office and back office. Interestingly, if you add one-time litigation cost here, which at coalition we exclude from analy of analysis, but I've I did that here, you can actually see that the FICC cost actually increased over the past four years. 
Switching to the equities picture, a very similar story. The headcount reduction has not translated into cost savings. Only 3% of costs were taken away in the equity space. Again, front office compensation, drastic reduction, 25%, but the rest were stable or increased. IBD, slightly different story, an increase in cost, in fact, uh, on the back of a very strong performance for the past two years, uh, which drove front office compensation higher. So now we've looked at the revenue picture, we've looked at the cost picture. Let's try to bring the two together by looking at, at operating margin. First, FICC operating margin. As you can see, the current operating margin or the expected operating margin for FICC by year end will be around 34% across these 10 banks, which is much lower than the 50% of 2010. In addition to the decrease, you can see the volatility of the operating margin in FICC. Equities, more stable, operating margin hovering around 25-30%. And IBD, again on the back of very strong revenue growth, a slight increase of operating margin in the past two years. Now what is also very interesting is if you compare the relative profit margin across asset classes. Whereas in the past, FICC was by far twice as profitable as equities or IBD, this is not the case anymore. All of the three asset classes being around 30-35%. When you combine all of that, you get the picture for the investment bank, which unfortunately is a downward trend where the 40% operating margin will be, we expect, or forecast to be around 33% by year end. So now we've looked at the profit margin. Uh, let's bring the last piece of the puzzle, if you want, in terms of capital to look at return on equity. So on this slide again, it's across the top 10 investment bank, their average return on equity at the IB level. So the 12% is what these banks are reporting uh, in the public domain. We at Coalition make a series of adjustments on the revenue and the cost side. So our uh, baseline is 15%. The main difference is coming from this one-time litigation cost that we exclude from our analysis. So with that baseline in mind, 15%, let's first look at FICC. Unfortunately, FICC has a lower, a low uh, return on equity at 11%. Now, this hides actually a very different picture across different sub products. You have the emerging market securitization relatively better because of very high profit versus G10 rates or G10 credit because of a very high capital consumption, much lower RW, um, return on equity. And a commodity is very low, which also explains why a lot of banks have started or will be exiting a lot of their commodities business, mainly on the physical side. Looking at the equities picture, uh, healthier return on equity around 19%, driven by the equity derivatives in the prime space. Cash equity at 13% comes as a surprise sometimes, uh, because a lot of banks actually are not even making money in cash equity, but when you, took, when you take the average, some banks are very profitable in cash equity, especially those with a, a private bank uh, to help them. So overall, 13%. And finally, IBD, less relevant because of light capital consumption, but quite high ROE driven, uh, you know, pushing the whole IB up. So now with that picture in mind, let's try to look in the next couple of slides of what it means for the industry going forward and what it means in terms of the new norm. So first, very importantly, let's look at the client activity. So now we are moving away from the top 10 investment banks and we're looking at the overall markets. And what you have in front of you is a bottom-up aggregation of an analysis around 20,000 clients of the investment banks, both institutional client and corporate client. And as you can see, for the past six years, again, the client activity has been very, very weak, mainly on the institutional side, with a decrease almost year on year every year. Corporates doing a little bit better, especially last year, with a, good, uh, a slight rebound. So now this weak client activity has uh, a few drivers. Clearly, there's uncertainty uh, in, the, in the environment, and clients are not necessarily trading, keeping some cash on the balance sheet. Uh, there's also some uncertainty related to the regulation environment. But what we've seen at Coalition is the trading pattern has changed from this client. They are not trading as often, they are not trading the same asset classes, and they are clearly not engaging in the same you know, juicy one-time deal that used to be uh, the case in the past. Therefore, we think, unfortunately, this weak client activity, which we experienced for the past six years, will remain so at least for the next two years. If now you look at the client activity by region, you see a very similar picture. Each of the three regions saw a decline or are expecting to see a decline this year. 
Americas. There was a strong start of the year. Unfortunately, we don't expect a, a good rebound for the rest of the year, so we'll see a decline. Uh, Europe, very far from the high of 2009. That will not happen again, that's for sure. Europe starting to maybe finding its, its bottom and hovering around $75 billion. And Asia Pacific with a drop again last year. Uh, let's keep in mind that the $57 billion in 2013 was driven a lot by some specific one-off activity in Japan that we don't see that repeating in the, in the short term. So overall, a very weak land activity. So what does it mean now for the overall industry? So let's step back a little bit. Let's look across the cycle at the total revenue pool for the industry. So what you have here is the overall sales and trading PNL, not just the client activity, but the overall PNL for the investment banks, all the investment banks for, uh, since 2005. And clearly what you can see is that from the high of 2009, which are behind us and will never happen again, the industry has been declining slowly. So the question is, you know, what's going to happen in the next two years? And are we going through a structural change or a cyclical change? We think at Coalition that the industry is actually going through a structural change. Yes, there's a bit of cyclicality with the low interest rate environment, the low volatility, but uh, it's a structural change. So let's start to think about the new norm by the top. Let's look at IBD, 80 billion, uh, 82 billion, sorry, very high. You know, let's give it another 80 billion going forward. Then we look at equities, 62 billion, maybe a little bit below the highs, maybe some upside. This year was not great, started well, didn't follow. So let's give it a $65 billion for equities. And then FICC, which is the largest part. In order to, to look at the FS, FICC properly, let's look at rates, which is the, the largest uh, product area here. As you can see, rates used to be 40% of the FICC in 2009, only 23, 25% now. Yes, this 30 billion uh, is low because of a low volatility environment. You know, let's bump that a little bit. Let's say it's 40, 40 billion. Um, unfortunately, if you look at the other sub-product within FICC, that will, we think, end up around $125 billion. So putting together the 80, 65, and $125 billion, that gives you what we think is the new norm, at least for the next two years, $270 billion. The number doesn't really matter. Uh, what matters is the, 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 the trend, and that basically the message here is that there's limited revenue growth opportunity uh, in, in investment banking world. So with that in mind, let's now look at the last section and what banks can do um, to, to compete effectively. First, we're going to look at uh, the positioning of these top 10 investment banks along two axes, completeness versus efficiency. Completeness, completeness sorry, the x-axis, we are comparing each bank in terms of product mix, client type mix, and regional mix against the average of the market, and efficiency we are comparing against each bank against the average of the market in terms of headcount productivity, how, much, how many revenue dollars of revenue per headcount, RWA pro productivity, how, much, how many dollars of revenue per unit of RWA, and profitability of operating margin. So we've plotted the top 10 banks at the end of full year 13. And clearly what you start seeing here is two groups of banks emerging. On the right side, you have the banks which aspire to be complete, more complete. On the upper left, you have banks which have really decided to focus on efficiency. We think at Coalition that the coming two or three years, banks will really have to make tough decisions and they will actually migrate into one of these two groups. Clearly right now in the completeness uh, group, if you want, you have uh, the three American banks and we would expect them to stay in that group, question mark around the others. Efficiency, you have the two Swiss banks and we see a few other banks migrating towards that group. Just keep in mind the analysis was done at the end of full year 13. A few of these banks have already restructured, changed a bit of their strategy, and we would expect some of them moving into that upper left group. So in order to move into that uh, one of these two groups, banks have to make three decisions. The first one is which asset classes to focus on. So let's start here with the FICC space. What you have in front of you is the normalized FICC revenues for these top 10 banks. And as you can see, the slope is very steep, which means that banks have decided to focus on specific areas, either rates, the macro world, or the, the micro world. 
but clearly they don't seem to compete as much with each other uh, as in the past. Look at the picture on the equities world, a very different picture. The top seven banks are really very close to each other. Intense competition in the equity space. All banks want to offer everything to everybody everywhere, from cash, prime, equity derivatives, and so on. That, we think, is not sustainable in the long term. Banks will have to make decisions. IBD, less competitive, clearly the three American ahead, given the advantage of the home market, but also the power of the DCM franchise. So banks first will have to decide which asset class they really want to focus. Then the next question is which sub-product to look at within this asset class. So let's take them one by one. Let's start at FICC. So what you have in front of you here is the operating margin of these top 10 banks across each sub-product. Each of these yellow stars represent one of the top 10 banks. As you can see, overall FICC productivity at 39%. Securitization, G10 rates, very high uh, profit margin versus commodities or G10 effects, much lower. Very interestingly, some banks are actually losing money in G10 effects, in commodities, and even in some of the, the other products once you include these one-time litigation costs. So banks will have to make you know, very difficult decisions. Do they want to stay in G10 effects or not? If you don't have a strong corporate franchise, a strong transaction banking franchise, or a very good electronic platform, you may not want to play there. On the equity space, same idea. Average 31%, equity derivatives, prime services, quite profitable, but also very interestingly, all the banks very close to each other, very similar level of profitability across the street. The question is the cash equity space. Um, some banks are clearly not making money, some banks are losing money. We think that unless you have a very strong um, prime brokerage franchise or a strong private bank, it's gonna be difficult to make money there. Now you may want to stay there for other reason, for cross-selling reason, but it's gonna be very difficult to make money in the cash equity space. Finally, IBD, DCM, no surprise, extremely profitable, M&N and ECM together, question mark around uh, profitability here. A lot of banks are using that almost at a, as a loss leader. Um, and um, now keep in mind that the recent strength in revenue will improve the profitability here, but there's still some question for a lot of banks. Now let's look at the last third dimension, which is the regional dimension. So what you have in front of you here is the productivity, i.e. the revenue generated per front office revenue producer, for at the global level, so FICC 4 million per head versus uh, equities at 2.3 and IBD at 2.2. We're gonna start by the bottom by Asia Pacific. So Asia Pacific, clearly the average productivity much lower than the global productivity and that clearly explains a lot of the decision that some banks have already made or are thinking of making. How do I serve my customer in Asia Pacific? Do I look at the onshore client only? Do I look at both the offshore and onshore? Uh, do I run a hub and spoke model, flying model, and so on? Very difficult question, but nobody is really making a lot of money uh, in Asia, especially with a very fierce competition from local players. EMEA, very good productivity uh, across FICC and equities, uh, even higher than at the global level. And here, interestingly, the banks are really close to each other, which means they are competing for the same business. They are very similar business model, and. Um, as we've seen in the past two years, the US banks are really pushing hard and trying to get market share, uh, market share in Europe, both on the FICC and uh, uh, the equities space. Finally, Americas, where clearly the IBD, you can see the IBD outlier, you cannot have an IBD franchise if you're not in, in the States or in Americas, definitely not. But interestingly, for FICC and equities, a dispersed set of uh, yellow uh, stars, which means that banks have different business models, are focusing on different strengths. Um, so, overall, decision to be made around how you want, where you want to have your original presence. So, let me just wrap up with the, the key messages uh, that we've covered in the past 15 minutes. First, unfortunately, the medium term revenue growth is limited. Structural changes are taking place, very weak client activity pressure on profitability, especially on the non-front office activities, and my colleagues who probably will cover a lot of that, what banks can do to reinvent the operating model there. Low ROE for some product, not all product, for some product, which implies further cut of RWA or balance sheets. And my colleague James will, will cover a bit of that in the third section. 
But we think that investment banks going forward will really have to make a strategic choice. Do they want to be complete? But we think only a few banks will be able to be complete. Or will they want to really look at efficiency? They will de therefore have to make decisions along these three dimensions, which asset class to focus on, which product to offer, which re region to, uh, to play in. And we think that could help them to capture not revenue growth, because there's going to be limited revenue growth, but possibly return on equity growth. So with that in mind, ask my uh, colleague Supraba uh, to come and talk about the operating model. Thank you. Good afternoon. Stefan has just showed us how the financials of investment banks have changed significantly in the past few years, causing them to reassess their business models. In this session, I will be talking about how banks are transforming their operating models in response to the structural shifts that the industry is seeing. Let me begin by explaining what we mean by a bank's business model and an operating model. The business model of a bank is about a, business, a bank's decision on what to sell, whom to sell, and which regions to serve. The operating model question is about execution. It's about people, processes, and technology that serve the business. So in this session, we will look at how banks are transforming their operating model to address long-term profitability issues. So why do banks need to transform their operating model? We have seen that the profitability of investment banks have been declining in the past few years and stands at mid-single digits in comparison to the uh, historic highs of 2008. We believe this is because of three structural shifts that the industry is seeing. Number one, the impact of regulations. Number two, industry revenue is declining as such, as Stefan showed you. And number three, technology is changing the face of the industry and reducing differentiation levels and thereby impacting the pricing power. A couple of examples will make this clear. Because of the regulations that are governing OTC derivatives are changing, we are seeing that the FICC business, which has already shrunk in the past few years, is expected to shrink further. In fact, many banks are responding to this by shutting down their commodity desks and commodity derivative desks. On the technology side, while automated platforms and trading platforms are lowering transaction costs, at the same time, they're also impacting the uh, differentiation that the banks are able to create and thereby bringing down their pricing power. When we're talking about this, I'll also be quick to point that banks have indeed done a number of things in the past few years in terms of restructuring initiatives, which are, such as reducing headcount and also exiting unviable businesses. However, the cost to income ratio continues to be very high, which means banks got to do much more. Across all the banks that we are working with, we are seeing two things happening. Firstly, banks are drawing up plans for restructuring their front office, middle office, as well as back office functions. And banks are reassessing the deployment of their people, processes, and technology. So now let's look at how banks are transforming their operating models. When it comes to front office, we see that the differentiating service quality is the key guiding factor. This is irrespective of whether a bank functions as a full service bank or restricts its activities to niche segments. We're seeing that banks are pursuing differentiation in areas such as research and data products, ease of execution of trades, and in collateral management. When, it, when we come to middle office, we see optimizing the cost structure is a key guiding factor. In the past five years, banks have made significant investments in the IT and risk management capabilities in the middle office area. Such investments have actually helped banks manage their regulations better, but it has come at the cost of profitability. Time has come for banks to take a hard look at their high fixed cost structure in the middle office area. In this context, we believe there is an opportunity for banks to come together to create common industry assets for activities that are duplicative in nature across the functions. One such example I would like to point out is the area on counterparty credit risk assessment that banks do perform to set exposure limits. We believe that this is an activity that can be largely done on a single industry platform and thereby bring down costs. While this is not yet a reality, we are in discussions with a number of banks, and, it show, and initial discussions show us that 80% of this can be done on a common industry platform, and 20% will remain in-house. And this is one of the functions to begin with in the middle office area that can bring down costs. Finally, looking at back office, 
It has always been in the thick of action when it came to cost saving initiatives for banks. Today, the mandate for back office is very clear. Re-engineer the processes in front office and middle office, standardize and automate them and move them to back office. As we see that banks are transforming their operating model, we are seeing that they are also consolidating offshore vendors. This is because the primary reason that banks need strategic partners when they embark on large transformational agenda. One of the key decisions here will be where will people be located and thereby offshoring becomes a key enabler for the transformation. With that said, what do we see in Crystal as the new wave of offshoring? While offshoring will be a key enabler for transformation, it will be fundamentally different from the vanilla offshoring of the earlier period. Plain vanilla offshoring in the past was a migration, uh, was a play on the migration of people and processes from one location to offshore locations. Technology played a less significant role. However, in the new wave of offshoring, we are seeing that technology will play a significant role and we are already seeing that banks are stepping up the usage of tools and analytics in standardizing tasks and enhancing productivity. So there are three new types of offshoring solutions that we see in Crystal that are emerging within banks. Firstly, we are seeing that banks are setting up integrated teams across on-site, nearshore and offshore locations to enhance specialization. Secondly, we are seeing that banks are setting up common teams in single location, which is mostly offshore, to serve multiple divisions of the bank. And finally, we are seeing that banks are looking to solve their talent problems by tapping into the global offshore talent pool. Here again, a couple of examples will help. When it comes to research, what we are seeing is that large banks today are streamlining their research desks in such a way that they are asking offshore teams to manage independently the coverage of low volume stocks. We are also seeing that banks are requesting uh, offshore providers to set up nearshore teams to provide enhanced support to the on-site teams. Both of these are helping on-site research teams today to spend more time on institutional client servicing. The second example relates to global talent pool. Today, offshoring solutions are actually gaining a place in areas that are talent staffed, such as CCAR and, um, and quant related work where niche analytical capabilities are needed. Here we are seeing banks using third party solutions, which was inconceivable a few years ago. With that said on the new wave of offshoring, what do we see as the potential for restructuring? Over the past six to 12 months, we are seeing that most of the banks have embarked on a large transformation agenda. Very likely the large banks will be the uh, first movers. We're also seeing several mid-sized banks now looking at offshoring to compete better in the market. At Crystal, we believe that the transformation with the transformation agenda, the offshoring headcount will move to 25 to 30% of overall banks headcount compared to current levels of 10 to 12% once the entire transformation is completed. As you can see in the chart below, the potential for headcount varies anywhere between 15% in areas such as sales and structuring and can go up to 80% in areas such as research. Many people ask us how we've arrived at these numbers. We have uh, taken one of the three approaches. One, these are actual observed numbers in a client place, or these are numbers that have been taken as, as their targets in internal dashboards. And finally, we've done a detailed activity-wise analysis for each of the functions within the bank to assess the offshoring potential. If you look at the methodology, what you see here is more in the traditional mode of offshoring. It would appear that banks have found offshoring solutions in all the activities because the blue tick marks dominate. However, do note that this is the traditional mode of offshoring. If you look at the new wave of offshoring, you would see that the number of red tick marks, are, uh, red marks are more, showing that the offshoring potential is yet exists. Many banks have already started doing it. What it shows is also that there's still a fair way to go before realizing the full offshoring potential in these activities. With that, I would now move on to an example of the COO and the CFO function within the banks. The COO and the CFO function today is in the forefront of the new offshoring solutions. 
the activities between the COO and the CFO functions are very similar. And uh, for instance, the data analysis, collection, uh, reporting and monitoring, etc. We believe that integration of these two business, these two uh, uh, activities in these two functions will actually help in saving costs significantly for the banks. The table that shows here, that you see here is actually the range of offshoring uh, offshore headcount that Crystal has observed in the 12 banks that we work with. The min and the max refer to the range of offshoring levels, and the yellow dot right there shows the median. For example, if you look at one of it, which is the IB reference data, what we see is that offshoring can help provi provide efficient and cost-effective management of data, uh, which includes key client data, uh, data on products, as well as contacts. Swift migration of these activities is possible. Technology will play a huge role, and we see a potential of 80 to 90% here, with most of the teams sitting offshore. In contrast, if you see yet another uh, function, which is the strategy and analytics, you see that the offshoring potential will be in the range of 50% here. And in these areas, while the analysis, actual analysis can be done uh, offshore, the actual decision making will reside onshore. Here we see teams being set up both in the near shore as well as in the on-site teams. The COO and the CFO function is just one of the areas that is being transformed in the new offshoring uh, models. To summarize whatever we've seen in the last few minutes, the new wave of offshoring is characterized by one, newer functions that are being looked at for offshoring, two, greater use of technology to make offshoring more effective, three, Accessing the global talent pool in talent-staffed areas like the regulatory compliance. And finally, newer themes that are emerging, uh, such as exploring use of common industry assets. At Crystal, we believe that there are certain structural changes that have happened in the investment banking industry that are here to stay. Banks that, are a that would be able to transform their operating model more radically and quickly would come out ahead in the game. Thank you for your attention. I would now like to invite uh, Dr. James Liu for his presentation. Thank you, Suprabha. Good evening. Uh, one of the key concepts in Basel and the stress testing is the risk weighted assets, or RWA. There is a wider variation in RWA calculation and therefore the capital requirements. A significant reason of such variance comes from the variations in the models that the different banks use. So therefore, my discussion tonight would be the role and the importance of modeling in efficient capital management. I should add that this is a very special, unique presentation that I have ever done in my career without using a single mathematical equations. And, uh, of course, this is to make it simple. So never have models been more important than they are today. This is mainly because regulators have made models central in determining the capital requirements. And models are used for calculating RWA, and therefore the capital requirements for stress testing. Models are also used for deter determining the capital allocation as well. The models for RWA needs to be very robust, since different modeling approaches, for example, the modeling assumptions, the data inputs, the modeling theories, they all could lead to the variations in RWA and therefore the capital requirements. While regulators have mandated the use of models for banks, banks' senior management has in, is increasingly using models for other strategic business decisions. For example, in one bank, Crystal helped the bank to calculate the RWA at the level of each trade. However, management is also interested to see which trades are more profitable and which trades require less capital. So this helped them to take a strategic decision on which trades to focus. That being said, banks are significantly increasing their resources on the technology and the modeling. Banks, is also, banks are also seeking external help from consulting firms 
and the specialist firms such as ours to respond to regulatory pressures in a timely manner. Now let us take a look at what the regulatory expectations are and how banks are faring against these expectations. Based on my experience with various large banks and the crystal's experience of working with banks in multiple regulatory jurisdictions, this slide shows you some of the key aspects that regulators focus. It also shows you what and how we at Crystal observe as the current state of the industry in modeling related activities. On this slide, we're going to discuss three key aspects of regulatory expectations. Model development, model validation, and model governance. The first area is sound model development. We have seen many instances of regulators checking to make sure that models are used for their intended purposes. In one instance, we observed that models which we meant to be used for regulatory capitals is, are also used for calculating the economic capitals or the bank's own internal capital. This clearly caught the regulator's attention since regulatory capitals need to be responding to short-term effect while economic capital needs to be more stable. Another important point is to ensure model, uh, the underlying modeling theory is robust. For example, would you use a more sophisticated simulation model or a simple fallback Excel spreadsheet? This all depends on the level of accuracy you expect. Moreover, use of relevant, relevant data is key. We have seen a few instances that models have been developed using data 2009 and 2010 onwards. This type of model is difficult to pass the regulators since the 2008 crisis data is completely missed out. Regarding model validation, regulators require model validation and the model development functions to be independent from each other. By now, most large banks have established independent model validation function. However, model, develop, model benchmark and model documentation need significant improvement. It is important that models get documented properly and are capable of being reconstructed by a third party. When it comes to model governance, we have seen that banks have broadly put policies in place and are now making investments in model audit. However, the most neglected aspect has been getting adequate business inputs into the model developing process. Finally, it is also very important to ensure that these models are very well integrated into the bank systems and the processes. In one bank, we saw that the models were in place However, due to the com computing capacity netto, 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 uh, bottleneck, the models will only be run at 70% of the capacity uh, on a daily basis. So where does the industry stand now today? In the short word, considerable progress has been made, but uh, a few key areas of concern remain. For the remainder of this presentation, we will focus on two of the most critical areas of concern, which are highlighted in red on the slide. One being linking the macroeconomic variables into the models, and the second being getting adequate business inputs into the models. Let's now turn our attention to the first issue. On the one of the key challenges that we see banks have is to correlate models with macroeconomic variables. So how is this link established? In order to illustrate, we have compared the traditional modeling approach on the left side with a more rigorous modeling approach on the right side. So a prop 
stress testing model using a more rigorous modeling approach needs to be it needs to in, engage lots of uh, data intensity and also establishing the statistical relationship of the model with the macroeconomic variable, such as GDP growth rate, interest rates, unemployment rates. Therefore, projections based upon the more rigorous modeling approach combines econometric or statistical modeling results with well-justified and documented business judgment which is the, the regulatory preferred. Since building proper stress testing models requires substantial investments in gathering data, modeling development, model validation, and documentation, it is important that banks link the modeling efforts to the relative importance of income and expense drivers if the objective is to model non-interest income behavior for a bank. So for example, in this chart, for a pure bank like Morgan Stanley on the far right side, 90% of overall income comes from the non-interest income. While for another bank on the left side like RBS, this percentage is only 30%. So people could naturally ask what drives this drastic difference for these two banks. So translating this into the modeling exercise is the obviously different modeling approach in terms of identifying the income and the expense drivers, which typically includes macroeconomic driver, uh, variables. Now let's talk about the second issue, getting adequate business inputs into the model development. Crystal's experience suggests that, well, banks have a seamless cooperation across stakeholders such as front office, middle office, risk and technology, the capital calculation frameworks are better. Crystal also believes that in the case of stress testing, scenarios obtained from front office insights are the most relevant. Similarly, for complex instruments like exotic derivatives, it is very important to tap into the knowledge of the traders. When it comes to middle office, banks need to ensure that better data availability and adequate investment in technology are in place. Finally, there is often a misconception that most complex models are the best models. In Crystal's view, this is not strictly true. Use of, a mo use of the most appropriate model rather than the most complex model is of top importance. Indeed, one of the key debates in the industry right now is whether banks' internal models have become too complex and whether standardized models need to be emphasized much more. This concludes my presentation. 